right. Wow. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> that, that's the first time I've ever heard that live since I recorded it with Eric Hochberg about 11 years ago. So uh, welcome. This is super fun. So, this is both Base Expo Day for Golden Gate Base Camp, and this is the 500th episode of a podcast I started over a decade ago called Contrabase Conversations. And as I look out here, I see several people that I've had on the show. So we're going to be chatting with some of them, and we're going to hear hearings from some new folks. Uh, but first of all, I want to take a moment and thank and then welcome up here the person who puts this camp together and talk about a massive task, if, <laughs> putting an event on like this is not easy. So let's bring up and give a hand to Camp Director Richard Duke. Thank you. So tell us about the history of this camp. When did it start? What did it look like? When did you get involved? Well, from talking to some people, uh, like Pat Clovis was there. He's here today, and he was here for the very first one, which was 20 years ago this year. Initially, uh, when Barry Green retired from Cincinnati Symphony as the, their longtime principal, moved to the Bay Area, he did some workshops, and then he started a summer camp up in Marin in the summer of 98. And he ran that until 2011 when the base convention was here. And after that, he moved to San Diego, and there was going to be no no camps after that, uh, and I'd, I'd worked with him for at least six years in the summer, and I'd come over to help out and then became one of the faculty members, and so we decided I would try and reconstruct it, but I couldn't do it in Oakland. I didn't live there right next to the, the facility. He was, li he was close to that, so um, my wife and good friend work here at Drew, and we um, thought, is that possible? Could we? And they said, yeah, let's give it a shot. So we started it in 2012. 2012 here, and we're at the Drew School here in San Francisco. Yeah. Beautiful facility in the theater here. Great place to have a camp like this. So besides the new venue, what else has changed since 2012? What's come on board? How is the offering? How have the offerings changed? Well, um, one of the biggest things is there's a recording studio here. So we get to do you know recording studio classes where we've had things when, when Rufus Reed was here or when um, uh, um, John Clayton came the very first year. We do some uh, classes about how you record the bass because that's not easy. It's you know, and Bill Bill Gould's here today to do that and talk about just these different problems you encounter, how you know how you can get it wrong and then how you can get it right. I'm sure it, that's we come up with that all the time. Also, the facility is really cool. The theater here is awesome. It's a great space for um, for for acoustic low end playing just happens to be this room is really receptive to it. And so we've done chamber music here. We've, I usually get a string quintet in somehow to play either chamber music or we've done uh, excerpts like Mozart 35 with the string quintet and it sounds like the orchestra. I get students to play with that. Um, and then you know, a lot of the faculty has been um, the, sim the same from like the Barry Green era and it's just kind of evolved. Diana Gann has been here. John Kennedy was here for a long time. Uh, and then we've had the last two years primarily locally based um, like faculty and teaching artists because I thought there's hundreds of good bass players here and if people are going to travel to San Francisco from you know like Colorado we have uh, we have somebody from Indiana and Illinois we've had people from Florida I want to showcase the talent that's here like all the symphony guys they've been generous they come in do classes on orchestra rep, Joe Lesher from the opera, Jeff Denson's here, he's from the Jazz Conservatory. There's a lot to, to show off in the Bay Area. Yeah, great things happening in the Bay Area. So many great artists like those you mentioned, and what a great opportunity for people, both from the Bay Area and outside, to come in and see all that's going on musically and what the bass scene's like. And electric bass. Yes. There's, there's been a lot of electric bass at previous incarnations, but I've tried to encourage it to be just just bass, you know, if it's an electric or if it's an upright or whatever it is, like we have um, a bass voice tomorrow uh, coming in for the concert, uh, you know, bass baritone singer from San Francisco Opera. He's in the same range as us. He's got the same, same uh, concepts in some ways in a whole different world. And so it's nice to have people in the same low range. Uh, but I want electric players to be as included as anything else. You know, so we've invited faculty like Michael Mannering, 
was so generous last year coming in and he came back this year and Cody is here. You know, Kai Eckhart's been in here in the previous years. There's also a ton of electric bass talent right here. Yeah, so for whether it's a bass singer or double bassist or electric bassist, everything from bass vocals to two-handed tapping, we've got it here yeah, this week. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to be as open for him as possible for people who play anything. Like, you should be able to find something out of this this week that, that helps you kind of kick things up a level. A, a question I, I, I know we, we, those of us here that have been involved in events like this, we know these events matter. Why, why should someone, would someone come to an event like this? What's special about just this experience? I think uh, like base community energy is unique in all families of instruments across the board, if it's this event or anything else. It always seems to be very welcoming to um, like big get togethers. But um, they're important because sometimes if you're in a band, you're the one bass player. And y you want to know other people. You're going to learn from your colleagues. And um, as much as you're going to learn from teachers or, or masters, and I think we should just know everybody that is in your area. Sometimes, like professionally, I, I have most of my good friends are bass players. We work together. Sometimes they'll call me to fill in for them, or I call them to fill in for me. And it's just good to know people in your community. And then the shops, like these guys are all here lined up behind us because I want these people to know who these people are. Like the students, the players, I want the shop people to be on their minds and I want the resources and information out there. So that when they have questions, they know where to go. Yeah. Yeah. And these guys are in business to like solve problems and people need to know they're there. And we'll be chatting with some of them later, and yeah. it's great to have them here. And so, Richard Duke, thank you for everything you do for the bass community. Welcome, it's really Jason. a pleasure. And it's nice to have you here. Oh. I just want to say <laughs> you've been a blessing to the whole community because you're so good at organizing and networking all of this, you know, along with me. So thanks for being here. Well, thank you very much. And thanks again. Speaking of uh, Michael Manring, we're going to bring both Michael up and a new addition to the bass faculty here at the Golden Gate Bass Camp, Cody Wright, who's just a phenomenal electric bassist. Let's bring them both up and give them a big hand. And as they're getting set up here, let's, we'll just uh, let them do a quick introduction, just a little bit about their career. We could chat with either one of them for an hour. We'll just take a couple minutes, and then we're going to hear some sweet bass playing, I'm sure. Michael, just tell us a little bit about yourself. I've been playing for a really long time. I kind of got my professional start with Wyndham Hill Records, which was um, had a really nice run in the early 80s, and we had some gold records and toured all around and played big places. And these days, I mostly focus on uh, mostly solo bass concerts, electric solo bass concerts, which is a lot of fun. But I also play with a lot of other people and do a lot of session work. I've gone well over 500 records I've been on at this point. So it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. And everybody that sees you play, I just love watching their eyes bug out. And they can't believe that they're hearing the sounds that they're hearing from uh, four strings on an instrument. So great to have you here. Uh, Cody, phenomenal player and internet sensation. I just love your videos and it's great to have you here. Just tell a little bit, uh, tell everybody a little bit about uh, what you do. Yeah. Well, I switched from guitar, electric guitar to bass about seven years ago. And as soon as I switched, I started getting actual work playing an instrument, which is really fun and really cool. And since then, I've uh, traveled all over the world, been very lucky to sort of keep the pick approach on bass and a sort of non-traditional approach on bass, which uh, gets me some unique opportunities and has been really cool. I've played with, um, I've shared the stage with all kinds of big names, but I've toured with Eric Gales and I just got off a tour with a Grammy winning band called Ghost Note, which is really fun. And I scored a video game soundtrack recently called Toe Jam and Earl for a PS4 and Xbox and stuff. And all, a lot of it is pick funk bass, playing funky stuff with a pick on the bass, which is really awesome. And with my Zahn bass here, it gives it a real unique sound, the graphite neck and stuff. So. And you'll notice another Zahn bass right here with Michael Mannering. So can't wait to hear some bass playing from two amazing artists. So thanks for being here, guys. Thank you. 
Michael Mannering and Cody Wright, everybody. And those of you here live, uh, you will get a chance to hear more from them tomorrow night, Thursday, at the faculty concert. So what, what fantastic bass playing. Uh, I'd like to bring up one of our uh, exhibitors now, someone who's been in the Bay Area for a long time, has a really interesting history. We're going to bring him up just to chat for a couple minutes. Please welcome Alex Friedman. How are you doing? Yep, we'll just hand me one. <laughs> one of me. There, have a seat. <laughs> Welcome, Alex. Thank you. Uh, so I hear you started off fixing cars. Is that right? No. No? <laughs> oh, I was misinformed. That's okay. Well, however you got into it, tell us how you got into not, this. Not long ago. Okay. Just go back when I was 17. 17, okay. I built my first arch guitar. Oh. Then one electric bass, and that's it, I stopped. That's it, you stopped? Stopped, yeah. Because my original profession is piano tuning and rebuild pianos. Oh. Cardion. So I work, a lot of work. But in the shop, I used to do it all, stringed instruments. All of them, violins, guitars, balalaika. Balalaika, really? Bas baseball like uh, you couldn't imagine. Probably. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, and then Long Gears was out of music at all, playing a lot, used to. And then that, like, uh, but I always fix basses, always. Mm -hmm. And start made. I don't know, maybe first call I did to, first call when I, come to Bay Area, I did to Tony, if you remember, right? Yeah, so, fix, fix, 24 hours. 24 hours. On service. <laughs> Tell us where you are in the Bay Area so folks can find you. Uh, South San Francisco. South San Francisco. 10 miles anywhere you go from everywhere. So if, we need, downtown. so if we need an instrument, or we pop the seam, or we got a crack. 24 hours. 24 hours, they can get in touch. Alex, thank you for what you do. 24 hour base service here in the Bay Area. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> All right, the next person I want to bring up. I, have, I first met him when he was, I believe, 19. And we were on the stand together for the Spoleto Festival in Charleston, South Carolina. And I remember one of the first impressions I had of this person was the ears on him. I just never seen anything like that. I remember we were sitting there and he said, listen to what the second clarinet's doing right there. Listen to how the viola line is going. I'm thinking, I never even noticed the second clarinet. What's going on? And it's been so fun to follow along with his career, and he does so many amazing things. Please welcome Philadelphia Orchestra assistant principal bassist, Joe Conyers. Hey, man. <laughs> All right, Joe. First question. Uh, when I first met you when you were 19, were you lifting weights then? I had just started. You just Actually, I was a little older than 19. Okay, 20? I was, uh, 20, 21, okay. somewhere in that, okay. that yeah, yeah, okay. about 20. I just started lifting, because I actually remember actually being there and, and trying to figure out where the, the nearest gym was so I can get my, my routine in. Okay. <laughs> what, what inspired you to start lifting weights? It's funny. So I, my whole life I've been, well, especially when I was at that point, been very music centric and my whole life was just like playing the bass, playing the bass, playing the bass. And my parents and my teacher were like, maybe you should do something else besides play the bass all the time. And I have a, 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 a maybe a slight obsessive compulsive tendency with certain things, so I just think they wanted me to divert some of my energy into other places so I wouldn't go completely crazy with bass. So I started lifting weights, um, and I've been lifting ever since, uh, since school. So I've gone through powerlifting phases, and I went through a bodybuilding phase, and, uh, and, and kind of in between right now, uh, try to keep things current. But, uh, I love what it does for me. I love what it does for my body. I love the way I feel. Um, I think it's been really helpful in um, actually injury prevention. I know this is a controversial topic, so I don't want to like offend anyone, but I can only speak for myself. But I started lifting at the same time people were telling me, like I was a very tense player. 
And it's a lot, mostly about disassociation and being able to kind of control what the body is doing and where to hold tension and where not to hold tension. Um, so yeah, I can go on and on about yeah. that. that. No, no, fascinating. So yeah. injury prevention, you've yeah. found very, that to be very helpful. Well, I remember being at Brevard Music Center, we had a nurse, Nurse Rhonda, if you're out there, I still remember you, <laughs> Nurse Rhonda from Brevard, this is over 20 years ago, and she would say, uh, we are small muscle athletes. So I really, really think about like when you lift weights, the big muscles are actually helping to support the smaller muscles so they don't have to work as hard and they're less prone for overuse injury. So this is also keeping in mind things like um, being active stretching and um, warming up the body before you play. All things that are really, really important because with time, things start to slow down and things get harder. And a lot of my, my colleagues and um, who are my age, younger and older, have, have experienced all kinds of um, uh, different ailments. I'm, I, I can just say to this point in my career, I've been injury free. So I'm, I'm very fortunate. Yeah. Something that you're so involved with, and again, we could, we could chat for hours about this, but, but uh, helping musicians to develop their skills outside of the practice room. Yeah. Project 440, can you talk briefly about that? We, and if you want to hear more about this, ContrabassConversations.com slash Joe Conyers. <laughs> we could talk for like maybe an hour and a half on this, but just share a bit about this, this Project 440. And sure. What it does. Well, I mean, the way I like to describe organizations is that we are a music organization that doesn't teach music. Really, we actually use music as a tool to teach entrepreneurship, leadership, and service. We service high school students, uh, and we've built an entire curriculum thanks to a guy named Mark Rabido at DePaul University. He's of 21cm.org. Look it up, it's a fantastic site, but we commissioned him to write a text for high school students from which we built an entire curriculum. I mean, our, the, the most extensive program, Doing Good, based off of the text by Mark, which is called Doing Good, Entrepreneurial Musicians Making a Difference, um, that, that is a 30-week course where the first 15 weeks are kind of coming up with an idea, learning about entrepreneurship, how can you service your community. And of course, in doing this and putting together a project, you're learning project management skills, learning how to deal with a budget. Uh, we vet the ideas, and then the second um, por portion of that class, they actually implement those ideas in the, in the community. So we have our high school students um, promoting music with, for other younger students to get involved, making music more fun. One group says, practicing is, is boring, how can we make it more interesting for kids? And they came up with a project to help do that. Some was, uh, uh, um, another project was, oh, uh, uh, for uh, middle school students, actually providing middle school students with kind of information about classical music, because these kids are really passionate about classical music, and it's like, well, there's not a, a, enough young people doing this type of work. So they kind of established their own program. So it's really neat to see the projects that students are doing. And I'm excited about it because uh, I love music dearly. And I think every student should have access to music. And with this, I hope we're building a conversation on why every student should have music. It's because you can learn all these wonderful life skills. And you get to be introduced to this wonderful art form um, of music, whatever genre it is, because we are not genre specific. In, uh, at Project 440. Yeah. Uh, if someone comes up to you and says, but Joe, I just want to play in an orchestra and I just want to, I, or I want to teach at a university, that, I'll, I'm good, right? Yeah. Uh, is, the, is that, is that, uh, uh, what, talk about just that concept sure. and like careers in music and what you see from your vantage point. I think for a long time, particularly, I'm going to use my classical lens here. Uh, for a long time, we've been told that this is what you kind of have to do. So you will one day, you will play in an orchestra, you'll teach at a university, you might teach at a school, and these are your paths. But at the end of the day, I mean, I, I, I feel like the possibilities for musicians are endless, really. I mean, we're sitting here in Silicon Valley, we're, 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 many of the industries here didn't even exist 15, 10, even 10 years ago, maybe some five years ago. Uh, and to me, that presents many opportunities in music just as well. So I know musicians and orchestras who are miserable, mainly because they never found what in their life actually sparked them and fueled them. Outside of one day you have to just keep practicing you win the job. Well, what happens after you win the job? And for all of you out there, when you do win the job, for me, it feels, for some it might feel like it's the end. But honestly, for me, it was the beginning. Because now I felt like I actually, I, 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 
attain what I wanted to as far as musically, but now I'm actually empowered to go out and inspire more young people, um, help give opportunities for young people, uh, um, so that everyone can reach the success that they might want to reach. Ira Gold of the National Symphony talked about auditioning or auditioning for him. It's like you, you uh, the winning the audition is like walking through a door and you're in a whole different room. Yeah. It's like a whole. Uh, and <laughs> and <laughs> you shared some really inspiring ad advice uh, about auditioning and your perspective, yeah. like when you're actually taking that audition yeah. and like what sort of unlocked things for you. Like, can you just talk about your mindset? Yeah. Yeah. In, in that moment. So I, I, we spend so much time working to like, I have to nail this and I've got to make the committee happy and are, they, are my eighth notes clean enough and blah, blah, blah. We're thinking, and those are all the absolute wrong things to be thinking about when you're actually doing the audition. You've done the work. I tell my students of uh, the orchestra I work with, um, I gotta give a shout out, All City Orchestra, Philadelphia. Uh, <laughs> uh, but with the orchestra I work with, I say we, we, we actually practice so that we can have fun. We learn technique so that we can have fun. So at the audition, all those hours and hours of practice are so at that moment, I'm not thinking about the technique, but I can actually kind of uh, um, just become, abandon myself to the music. And it's fun. I'm offering something to the committee. So instead of worrying about like, oh, what's the committee thinking? It's like, this is a gift for you. And I don't know, I, like, I, I'm, I'm so appreciative of this moment. I'm honored that you will hear me play. And this is who I am in this, in this moment musically, and I hope you enjoy it. And, and that's, it's literally an offering. Then actually playing auditions are way easier. <laughs> they're, way, they're just way easier because it takes, it's like giving a gift to someone. You aren't nervous about giving a gift to someone. I mean, not, I don't know what, I mean, generally you're like excited because yeah. you want to see their reaction. And that's kind of the way I took the auditions. And once that mindset changed and I wasn't trying to play, please everyone, all the teachers in my head, all the, all the other, the, the, my friends, all this, once I got all that out, playing auditions became way easier. And they were, they were actually kind of fun. <laughs> Which I know is strange to say, but they were, they, were, they were fun. It was an enjoyable experience. Well, I remember you saying that you were even, I think it was for the Philadelphia Orchestra, you were almost laughing behind the screen between... <laughs> between well, no, yeah, sections. because it, yeah, especially with all the characters and music and being able to, to bring all these characters to life, it's a privilege to do what we do. And I, once we make it work and make it hard, it's not fun anymore. And I, I like to have fun. I, I, I'd like to try to kind of, <laughs> uh, I take things pretty easily. And um, uh, yeah, I just, just, at the end of the day, just have fun. And share this beautiful gift of music with others. Uh, Michael Tilson Thomas, how appropriate, I'm in San Francisco, uh, said something when he was with the Philadelphia Orchestra recently, one of his recent trips. And I, I found it really um, powerful, and that is, music gives me the ability to say things in front of people I would never say with words. And that, I just, I, I think that's, a, it's like a miracle to be able to do that. So I consider it a blessing to be able to do that and um, sharing that with audiences. Well, Joe, thank you for what you do in all these multiple capacities. It's really, it's inspiring and makes me feel unbelievably lazy anytime <laughs> I look into what you're doing. But I just, I just, I get such, uh, I, I become so inspired just seeing everything you're doing. So thank you. Great to have you here at the camp and thanks for chatting. Thanks. Likewise, right. Jason. <laughs> I'd like to bring up somebody who does so much for the bass community here in San Francisco. Uh, many of you probably are playing on basses from him. Uh, please welcome Steve Swan. <laughs> All right, Steve. So, guitars and basses. Guitars and basses. Okay, how did that happen? They're both helper instruments. I've always oh. played the rhythm guitar quite often with bass lines moving, either in swing style, jazz style, or country style. Bass is the same thing, supporting the band, the group of people you're playing with. So I've always felt like I was a support person. And this journey took me in a lot of different directions in my life. Uh, sold retail in stores, sold wholesale in distributor companies, and then I had an opportunity to work for Santa Cruz Guitar Company uh, about 1988, and my first day there of work, I made this big pile of wooden braces. It's like the most boring job in the shop. But before, I'd had just sales orders and numbers, and I had this pile of stuff, 
instead, and it really lit a fire under me. And I was uh, one of the early uh, employees of this company, and I learned a lot about top wood and the braces. So it's very similar to a base top and a base bar. So I learned a lot about what makes a bass tick through working on guitars for two and a half years and making them tick. And choosing wood, choose wood that would be appropriate for a voice uh, on a certain kind of guitar, a certain kind of function. Same thing here, it really helps me decide you know, when I can pick through a, a bunch of different basses that are brand new, I can, I can think, what are these things gonna sound like two, three, five, ten 10 years down the road? And it's really fun. So it's, it's, a, it's a perspective that a lot of people don't have uh, unless they've been selling, you know, basses a long time, like Alex and, and Tony, you can hear instruments develop through a certain player five, 10, 20 years down the road. And it's really kind of magical what happens when a person like you who practices a lot, I'm sure, and performs, you know, will put their music and their soul into this bass and it starts to sing, you know. So it's pretty amazing. It's fascinating how basses seem to change like that. And I've always, yeah. I've always wondered, like, if someone plays more in tune, I wonder if it rings better or out of tune, you know, like, are you encouraging the wood to open up? And it's, it's amazing. If you haven't been to Steve's shop, you've got to go there. How many basses do you have in there? You I, have a... I can fit 70 in the okay. front room. And, and my visual model for that was John Peterson's shop that doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. It's a world of strings. Mm -hmm. And he would have 80 basses in the shop, and maybe two-thirds of them were in for repair. But to walk through that front door and see all these musical hippos standing up straight just would suck the air out of my lungs. It was just a mind-bending experience for me to walk through that front door. And I think, I, you know, John is one of the guys, he's still alive, even though he lost his shop. And he was, he's always very encouraging to me, he became sort of a, a soft mentor to me in learning the ropes of this kind of business that I developed out of my own need. I mean, there were a lot of people who had served the bass community for years, like Nash Mondragon and Al Droyan, and they all kind of disappeared and retired and went on their own way. And I, when I got drafted to play in a band to play in 1998, I had to go down to LA that first year back and buy four different basses that first year down in LA. And I thought, this is ridiculous. So in 1999, I bought one bass at the NAMM show, and I just kept coming to work for almost 20 years. It'll be 20 years in January. And you travel with it. You're going yeah. up to Oregon. You're going up to Seattle. Up to Seattle. Yeah. You know, yeah. And back, you know, out to Arizona, you know, wherever people want to see a selection, they don't have options. Or if I have a line on some bases I want to check out and maybe buy or trade, you know, I have the option. That's, that's the beauty of me not being tied to a workbench in a shop is I, I can take off for two or three or four days and, and you know, the shop will still function without me. Well, something I noticed when I went to your shop, the, many of your bases, you, you were describing the sort of setup that you'd had done. Yeah. I, I, I might be getting the details wrong, but a little bit of re-graduation of the top, uh, outsetting the neck. Um, what, what, can you just talk a little well, about so what, that? What happened when, when steel strings came into general use around 1959 is the German bass makers flipped out, and they really got scared that they're going to get big shiploads of bases back that got wrecked by these high-tension steel strings. And so they did three things that really changed the function of the instrument. They shortened the string length, and they lowered the neck angle so the bridges weren't that tall anymore. And then they made the tops a lot thicker. They really wanted to ensure that these bases were not going to come back across the ocean uh, for work anymore. And so the bases tend to sound kind of nasal, and they didn't have any depth. They didn't have a chest voice at all. Yeah. You know, and so what we do with, with you know, increasing the neck angle, and we can also increase the overstands for modern playing, can get up in a thumb position a lot easier. So a neck reset can accomplish that. Sometimes we'll transplant a neck or make a new neck for these bases that might have a string length that are not friendly to modern playing. I just changed a neck out of a framus. It was 43 and a quarter inches, and nobody wants to play that. Wow. Unless you're six foot five, you know, so we, we had a neck made. I had Hannah Maine down in Albuquerque make a neck that was like 41 and 7 eighths. It's a really nice neck. And her ex-husband, Michael, re-graduated the top. He and I worked a lot together for about three years in the shop. And we would pop tops off and I'd help him. I was, you know, learned so much working with Michael doing that kind of stuff. And he'd show me his approach. And I found some old uh, diagram based tops in an old violin making book that had 
violins, violas, cellos, and only four basses from kind of the classic period, the early 1800s. And I took a pattern of uh, kind of a topographical map of thicker in the center under the bridge, and then, you know, the thinnest is right near the edges, you know, just before it flares out and gets strong again. And I put in some measurements that I thought would work, and we use that as a general pattern for top graduation, and it really works. And, and there's one main guy who does it. He does really clean work, and he's really excited about this. He's, you know, 72 years old, and he doesn't get excited about much in the way of basses, but this thing really turns him on. So he's been doing this for about four or five years with the re-graduation. Wow. Well, and it really works. I mean, the, these basses just speak uh, quickly, resonant, beautiful, uh, bell-like sound, and just really, uh, if you haven't been to Steve's shop, again, you got to go. He's got basses from, for entry-level basses all the way up to professional models, and I just... Big shout out to you for everything you do for the base community here and all the way up and down the West Coast. We're well, thank you. And your enthusiasm is really contagious. I try to bring a little bit of you into every sales presentation oh. because this, <laughs> we're trying to infect everybody with the happy base virus. And it's really great. It's That's a good great virus. To know you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. <laughs> All right, I'd like to bring up, bring up two people. Donovan and I were just talking about, how, wh what, what are we going to talk with Bill Gould about? And I said, well, why don't we, we're both huge Faith No More fans. My very first CD I ever bought uh, was uh, Faith No More, the, the album with Epic on it, uh, uh, 89, what's the title, Bill? Yeah, the real thing, right? And that was that that was um, very first CD, eighteen ninety nine at Sam Goody or whatever. And uh, I remember like tr learning that bass line, you know, on my electric bass. And it's just it's such a thrill to have you here and working with all the people. So let's bring Donovan and Bill up to the stage. We got another one for you here. So tell us about just the origins of Faith No More and what those early years were like. The early years of uh, Faith No More were probably about 10 blocks away from here. Really? Yeah, we all lived in a house, and uh, we went to school. I, I met the drummer at UC Berkeley, where I, I grew up in L.A., came up to go to college, and, you know, I was kind of playing bass since I was about 13, always playing in bands, and, you know, went to school and tried to get good grades, and it got to a point where... You know, you tend to meet people like yourself in school, and, and he was, Mike Borden was a great drummer, and, um, you know, I played bass, and we kind of just hung out so much together, we kind of got this little language that we developed, and uh, we ended up, you know, crashing at each other's houses, and, you know, making music, and yeah, this is our neighborhood right here, so. Uh, <laughs> wow. Here it is, like 35 years later, almost, and uh, still doing it. When did you first hear Faith No More, Donovan? Um, <clears throat> Mid-80s, I guess, yeah. That would be, yeah. I think the first record um, came out in 1985. It was with, not with Mike Patton, right? But there, no, there's the a old singer, singer before, exactly. yeah. And uh, uh, I, I hated any slap bass, and then I heard <laughs> this. I was like, okay, you could do something interesting with it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, yeah. It's funny, because I come from a punk rock background really like when I was like 15 or 16 is when I was went punk that was it and uh but I grew up in LA and I, I worked for a pharmacy where I'd go into south central LA a lot and do a lot of deliveries and I heard a lot of like parliament it was just in the air everywhere and it was just kind of like I heard it all the time you know like when it's song even if you don't like it and it sticks in your head you it's in your head you know and you kind of have to say okay I like the song right and um, kind of like with a lot of funk music and slapping, it was kind of just something that I just heard all the time, and it was part of me whether I liked it or not. And I kind of brought that into kind of more heavier music because uh, it was kind of, I kind of knew it in a weird way. Well, that was, that was the thing for me, is I finally heard some slap bass that was like playing the music that I wanted to listen to. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> so, yeah. We, and, and Faith No More, you guys disbanded for a while and came back together, we did, right? Yeah. We, yeah, we disbanded for 13 years. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> what brought you back together? That was so weird. You know, it, it's, it's such a crazy thing because when you break up, 
you know, and it's like this big thing, you know, we toured a lot too. It, we were in these bands that was like on the road. We did one tour that was like 18 months long. So I came home like a year and a half later. And uh, that, that's kind of weird. And um, we just were just with each other every day and you know, not sleeping and eating bad and all these things. And we were just so tired of each other. But one day we all went and had lunch somewhere. And it's just like I sat in the room with the guys and I knew them. Even after 13 years, I hadn't really we hadn't been in one room together. And we were just like, happy to see each other and just poof, continued. <laughs> wow. Very strange. I wouldn't have expected that, but that's how it went. How is that? And this is a super wide question, but like the business... 85, 89, those years, and then that you know, massive success you right. know, that the band had. And then fast forward those 13 years, and now here we are in 2018. Uh, and again, we could chat probably for nine hours about how things have changed, but maybe what are, what are some things you've noticed? I mean, okay, so this is, it was a lot different back then in that there was, you know, people really wanted to sell records. And so everything about musicians was about making records and selling records. So... We're going to talk about this in my recording class, but um, I, you know, was from a thing when we had tape. We didn't have computers, and uh, also, uh, you know, we went into these really big studios because there were a lot of bands selling a lot of records, and um, they had really good engineers and really good equipment. And all I had to do was kind of play and write songs, and uh, everybody else would kind of do the rest in a way. Um, it was really different, and now I think that you know any musician really has to kind of know how to go from what they think in their head to exactly where it ends up. And that includes getting it online and getting it on Spotify or whatever. You kind of have to know every step of the process. And I actually think that's a good thing because it gives you a little more control over what you're doing and you can take chances and be responsible for yourself. So I like that personally. Were you always into recording? Were you the... I was. The, okay. When we wrote songs, I always had a little, uh, like a portable cassette recorder, like a four track and we would write ideas on that and that's kind of how I started I mean there's a thing that this is really dating myself but you get like little cassette recorders and I would get like record on a one cassette and then play that cassette and then play guitar while you could hear the cassette from the other speaker and use that kind of like a multi-track and a lot of guys believe it or not started that way and I kind of did too and it's just the more you learn the more you do it the more better you get at it then I'm like oh what's this thing like how come it sounds so good well that's a compressor what does that do and you just kind of like pick up little knowledge on the way and and it all adds up are are you working completely uh, in the box or out of the box in terms of plugins and that sort of thing these days how's that work for you well I started getting into computer recording around 95 96 it's pretty early uh, and so I've always kind of used plugins, um, but I have hardware too. Uh, they all have their strengths and weaknesses, but um, you know, it, the really important thing as a musician is that as long as it doesn't get in the way of you making music, it's all good. I, I got I. I'm very amateur, uh, uh, you know, I use Ableton and, and that sort of thing, but like, uh, give us maybe top, top Three Desert Island plugins. Like, what could you Ooh, not live without? Wow. Three to five. <laughs> I mean, any EQ, <laughs> any compressor, and I would say a really nice sounding reverb. Okay. okay. That's it. Donovan, you put out a solo album about 12 years ago. And I keep waiting Something for album like number two. Yeah, I know. Where's I'm the slow, album? Man. Why aren't you making albums? What do you think of the album and its place in, in here, here, you know, 2018? Talk, talk about that. Uh, well, that's a lot there. So, you know, I don't know. Um, why am I not making albums? I'm working on it. But probably I'm just going to put stuff online. I don't see any reason to make albums. Nobody buys solo double bass music anyway. So, uh, you know, I've got some things actually on my computer that haven't been edited that need to go up. And I went through a period where I did all the classical reps. So I did Eccles, Dittersdorf, Krusevitsky, Drake, all that, you know, the big five stuff. Um, so anyway, so eventually there'll be stuff up online. But um, I don't know, if I, if I get vain, maybe I'll uh, get some download cards and put it on iTunes or something. But um, nobody really wants to buy it, so I just figure I'll put it up and have it out, and it's slowly eking out there bit by bit. And what were the other questions besides why am I not doing anything? <laughs> yeah, I can't remember. No, I didn't phrase it exactly like that. But <laughs> 
though. Uh, and, and, and Bill, maybe it'd be a good question for you too. Like, where are album releases? Do they have? What? Why do albums, or do they still matter? Uh, how? How's that change? I'm an old guy, so they matter to me. Yeah. I mean, I, to me, it's a statement. It's like painting a picture. I, you know, mm -hmm. I like to make an album because I like to listen to albums. So, you know, I'm. I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to do it whether somebody's albums mean something or don't mean something. To me, that's kind of... I like, I like having a lot of variety in something uh, where it takes you in different places, but it all ties together. Uh, thoughts on v resurgence of vinyl? And now I know people are even issuing things on cassette, which like boggles the mind. I was so excited to get that Faith No More CD after all those cassettes I had. What do you think of... It's like people are kind of going in the other direction. I think people are going in all kinds of directions. Yeah. I think there are. I think there are a lot of people that are into cassettes. I, I work with a band in Chile, and uh, it's funny. They want their record on cassette. And that, that's cool. And you know what? They, they sold all the cassettes that they made. So, hey, awesome. <laughs> yeah, well, that, remember, Zach, he had Zach Rowden on, and he's, that's all he's doing now is cassettes. And he'll make limited runs, you know, 100 and then take them out and sell them, and then they're, you know, then they're items, you know. I saw the craziest thing. Nakamichi, this cassette manufacturer, just released a, a new double cassette machine that has a USB on the back that goes into your computer. <laughs> it just came out like a month ago, and it, wow, and it looks exactly like it did like in the 80s. It's crazy. That's, that's unbelievable and also incredibly <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Well, let me ask, because I've, I've had Donovan on the podcast like over 10 years ago, and I never asked this question, because I used to not ask this question, and then Bill, great to chat with you. Like, uh, but uh, I have a traditional question I usually ask people when they're on the podcast. I say, what advice would you give your 18-year-old self? And I'd love to hear the answer to that from, from both of you. Uh, Donovan. Well, um, my process was from delinquent to legit, like, you know. Uh, and so at 18, I'd probably say, uh, stop drinking, uh, don't drink and drive, go to class, um, that sort of thing. <laughs> Do you think your 18-year-old self would have listened to you? Absolutely not, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to hear that argument, though, yeah. between the two. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's, you get your life in order, I guess, would have been the thing. It really has nothing to do with music, but pretty much once my life was in order, the music was easier, so. Any oh, thoughts? Me, yeah. Uh, I would say that back when I was 18, everything that happened, you know, now or next week was everything. And, and just that uh, when you decide to do something, um, do something that, you know, you think you're gonna, you do it because you like it and you want to keep doing it. Do something that you want to keep doing. Yeah. Well, pleasure, pleasure to meet you in person and thanks for being here, Bill, and working with all the people. You're gonna love this uh, session. Definitely check it out. And Donovan, old friend, great to have you here. Great to chat. I'm gonna track you down sometime this week and we're gonna do a round two for the podcast. So thanks again. Okay. Awesome. All right, I'd like to bring up somebody who runs a company that I've been ordering. I think I ordered my first set of strings from this company. I think I wrote a check and mailed it to, I don't know if it was in Indiana at that point, back in the 80s. Um, but uh, I had a chance to chat with her at Bass Player Live in November in Hollywood. And just a charming, wonderful person and a new addition to the Bay Area. So we're so happy to have Tony Buffa with Lemur Music. Have a seat. There you go. Here? Sure, that works great. Hi, everybody. Wow, welcome to San Francisco. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But you've been coming here a lot. Your son lives in the Bay mm -hmm. Area? My son lives in Berkeley, Coleman. Mm -hmm. And my daughter is here, uh, lives in San Francisco. She's been here for about 10 years. Okay. And um, we have an opportunity to bring a satellite shop to the Bay Area. And I'm really thrilled to be taking over Gael McCann's space in Berkeley. Okay. 
So tell us about Lemur and the whole his. So, oh. and again, we could be here for oh, hours no, no, talking. No. So, we'll do the abbreviated version, but uh, Murray Grodner and uh -huh. Lee. Yeah, so Lee and Murray Grodner, mm -hmm. Lee Murr, started this company in 1964 on their kitchen table. Mm -hmm. And uh, sheet music, a few bows, some strings. They can buy this stuff at your local music store. So fast forward to about 1995, and my husband and I bought the business from them. We had about 1,200 items in the catalog at that time, and it was just a paper catalog, and you'd call in and send the money, and we'd send stuff. And I got really, really, really interested in all these items that I didn't know anything about. For instance, the strings. So now we have over 100 different kinds of strings for the bass, and I stock them. So when your emergency comes up, we can ship it. The sheet music was a really big introduction to me, and um, I'm a, quite a bibliophile, love book arts. So we started with about 700 titles. Now I have over 2,200 titles in the sheet music catalog just for bass and we publish through Zimmerman Publications. I work with arrangers and composers and teachers. Um, and then the bows, oh Lord, I love the bows, they're my special pet. Oh, yeah. And all along, we would travel to visit the people who make these items, bows, basses, uh, arrangers, teachers, string makers, bag makers case makers, and I'm always interested in how does this come together? I'm a chronic hobbyist, and I, I want to know how things are made. And in doing this, I learned about the products and the features and what you want and what you don't want. On the other side of the equation are the teachers and my customers, because when I started this business, I knew that the base was tuned in fourths. And it is. <laughs> and then and it still there. is, except for the people who like to tune in fifths. Uh. Uh. I had to ask my customers, okay, fine, I'll, I get this title, this Eccles title from International Music, number 1712. What is it? <laughs> and they would tell me. And then the people who were making the stuff, well, they were happy to tell me too. And I ended up now, today, in this luckiest place in the world where I'm in the middle. I'm between you and the makers. And I get to hang out with both sides. And I love that. Yeah, it's got to be a fascinating position to be in, and and the spe speaking of bows, you know, I my bow I play I play a Baron Doling bow I, I bought from Lemur, and I one of my friends back in Chicago, Andy Anderson, he plays a Doling, and yeah. I loved it. I said, where did you get it? He said, Lemur Music. I said, Lemur? That's where I buy my strings. You, they sell bows, and it was like sure sure enough, and sure you know, phenomenal bows, and then also basses, and you're 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 innovating for bass and the, the challenges we face in terms of travel with removable mm -hmm. necks and different, can you just talk about what you've been, how the bass side of things has evolved and like what you're offering for people who are traveling and, and that sort of thing. Well, when we started in 1995, um, we carried a few Wilfer basses and right away we went over to Germany, we met with Wilfer and we also met with Paulman and they were so happy to see us because their father had just retired, and they said, oh, it's the new generation with Lemur and Palman. And so we were selling other people's bases, and we did this for a long time. Then the Chinese thing came up, and they were available through distribution, but there was always something about it we didn't care for, or we thought there's potential for improvement. My late husband was an excellent uh, designer, guitar milder, and also acoustic engineer. And he started designing basses, and he would go and study and work with Palman and Wilfer and Stoll and all the bass makers in Germany. 
And we began to develop these ideas and designs. And we ended up with 14 proprietary designs. And some of them are made in China, Germany, one in Romania, one in Italy. And always focus on those bases um, because we can offer them with no middleman. We can offer them at a really competitive prices and we can help the teachers with their students. Um, we can build school orchestras. Um, and most of all, we can just hit the target for each instrument. You, you also do removal neck. Oh, you want to talk but, about flyaway? But I would, yeah, yeah. Talk about that, and also how someone can get that that system in their own base because you don't want them sending their base to you, right? You can also sell it to the luthiers. Yeah, talk about flyaway and talk about removal necks. Well, removable neck bases have been around for a long time. In fact, um, back to the late 1600s, and they were made that way um, because. It's no different putting it on the back of a cart and driving it, you know, rolling across the prairie or wherever you're going. But the removable neck base was, is a great idea, and it's been done a long time, but it's you got to be engineered from the get-go. To take a base and do a conversion on it, this is risky. And I personally, I'm a little reluctant to decapitate someone's base because I don't know how the neck is going to come out. It might pop out. We had one in the shop a while ago. It took us seven hours to get the neck out. So I think that conversion of your bases should be done through your local base shop, your local repairman. You know him, he knows you and your base and it should be done there. So we do make our removable neck kits available to uh, local luthiers. Mm -hmm. The hard part was really not making a removable neck or the mechanism. The hard part was making a case that could be checked as baggage. Airplane travel, nobody's rolling them around in two wheel carts anymore and the airplanes the airlines just get harder and harder to deal with. You know this. So we um, designed this really funky triple wall vinyl cardboard base in a box. And we had that for a long, long time. We had that for almost 10 years. And then recently we have redesigned. And we still use a triple wall um, polyvinyl plastic. Now we have aluminum corners on it. Um, it's uh, my testing at uh, Bass Player Live and with crossover players, you know, electric players. They're familiar with this type of case. They're familiar with this type of travel and, and packing your bass up and putting in a case and rolling it off. And so the crossover players overwhelmingly told me they like the new uh, flyaway case. And my, um, my, uh, regular <laughs> orchestra players, th they like it too. It's um, easier for me to produce them. So we're making them as fast as we can. Well, great. Well, thank you for continuing to innovate on the bass side. And, and it's a, the, a problem that's not getting any easier traveling with the bass. So it's great nope. to see you coming up with new solutions. And uh, we're so glad to have you here in the Bay Area. So thank you for everything you've done. And thank you for opening up shop here. And thank you. yeah, really thank looking you. forward to everything you're going to be doing here in the future. Thanks, Tony. OK, bye bye. <laughs> All right, we, our last guest today is somebody that I consider a, a great friend and a marvelous, marvelous uh, jazz bassist and vocalist. He's somebody that Richard brought into the Golden Gate Bass Camp faculty last year and was such a phenomenal addition. And you're just going to love this artist. And we're going to bring him up. We'll just chat for a bit and he'll close out the show with some music. Please welcome to the stage Jeff Denson. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. 
Tell me about the California Jazz Conservatory, where you teach over in Berkeley. What is this institution? What's the experience like being a student there? Um, so I'm a professor. I'm one of three full professors at the California Jazz Conservatory. And this summer, I will have been out here seven years. I'm really proud of the, the school. It's very different. I, I went to, I'm speaking on a podcast, meaning people are going to hear me. So let me, let me think about what I'm saying. Um, I went to Berkeley College of Music for my bachelor's degree. I went to Florida State University for my master's. I went to the University of California, San Diego for my DMA, my doctorate of musical arts. And I've given master classes at colleges and conservatories all over the United States and Europe. And we have a different program here, and I'm, I'm really proud of that. It's very community oriented. We're a small school, somewhere between 60 to 80 students, which sounds small if you think about a university, but actually if you think about a jazz department, it's actually pretty decently sized because we only have a jazz program. We, you don't go there for orchestral music or anything else. Um, but because of the small size of the classes, my classes are anywhere from private lessons to the largest class would be 15 people. A lot of them are five. Right? So everybody gets a lot of individual attention. We know what all of their interests are. And I, I look at all my students, I know what kind of music they're interested in playing, what they're listening to. That's very different. And all of the faculty at the school are active performing musicians. And so the students see us, or they see, like, they see me do jump through all these different hoops and then pack up my bass and fly away. <laughs> Which, by the way, my bass has a lemur fly away <laughs> removable neck system. So Jeff is, is such a fantastic musician in so many capacities, both as a vocalist and a pretty serious uh, Arco chops, too. And I love that you went and studied with Mark Dresser, the UC San Diego. Mark, uh, former podcast guest and listens to the podcast, so shout out to Mark. Tell us about what it was like uh, studying at UC San Diego. What was it like working with Mark? Oh, man. It was awesome. Um... At first, it was a severe culture shock for me, going from, A, never having been on the West Coast in my life. I'm from the Washington, D.C. area, and I lived in New York, Boston, two different places in Florida, D.C. So that, you know, that's that. But musically, you know, having two degrees in jazz and being a professional touring jazz musician, going to that school, all of a sudden, I was the only jazz guy. You know, I was the jazz guy. And... All of my classmates were conservatory-trained classical players. And we were kind of meeting in the middle. Some had already encountered new music. Others were coming from the orchestral world and now delving into. So I, I had to find a way to meet everybody in the middle. It was like my introduction to that world was, oh, you're a bass player? Great. Can you play in my recital? And Mark was standing there. He says, yes, he'll play in your recital. I'm like, who are you? A, who are you? And B, what are we playing? And they're like, oh, we're going to play Elliot Carter's A Mirror Upon Which to Dwell. Like, what? Sure. And Mark's like, he's going to love it. Great. Close the door. And then I opened the music and thought, oh, my God. What, <laughs> what, is, what is this? Um, but it was thrilling. It was, I was there for five years of shedding, practicing, working on technique and ensemble and solo music for eight hours a day, and then playing jazz gigs at night and then getting in a plane and flying to Europe to perform with either my band or with uh, jazz legend Lee Konitz. It was incredible. Yeah, and we're so glad to have you here in the Bay Area, and you, you keep so busy with all the different projects you're doing, playing, and then obviously teaching, and so thanks for finding the time and making the time to be here and working with everybody here, and you've got your bass here. I can't wait to hear. What are you going to play for us? I'm wondering that, too. Oh, that's okay. All right. Well, thank you, and take it away, Jeff Denson.
Jeff Denson, everybody. Thanks a lot.